He watched the video and thought, that was easy. He did the tutorials and thought, well, that was easy too. So now you're ready. Let's build a solution. Let's solve problems. But the problems you're seeing were supposed to be the easy ones. I'm at HSO. I currently work within a security architecture group. My current role is to help integrate Vault in solutions, to reduce secret sprawl, to reduce credential exposure, and to help generally, in general, to help minimize risk, all without slowing down development. Though sometimes there isn't any development, it's ops all the way down. This talk is a walkthrough of one of those solutions. It's different than many examples since it's a mostly operational environment, so there's really no development. Our challenge was a part of service was part of a ServiceNow integration to keep credentials in house as opposed to in the cloud. Um, I'll highlight the challenges, the solution, and the changes we had to make to reduce the risk. I'll focus on the parts that are typically not in tutorials. My goal is to give you insights to help you when building your own solutions. Some key things to keep in mind. While Vault is built for the cloud, the cloud is not necessary for Vault. Your existing infrastructure probably has parts you can use. What I mean is, the problems you encounter while new to you are probably not new in general. Chances are, your infrastructure has something you just haven't used yet. As with all solutions, understand the risks of your solutions and adapt to it. Risks may change after implementation. Be prepared to change the way you, you make your solution. As I mentioned, this is a ServiceNow solution. So let's set up the context. ServiceNow is in the cloud and it does great things. But for some of these things, it needs access to your systems. And naturally that includes sensitive credentials. For those who are not in the cloud, this access is a little bit touchy. But ServiceNow has the mid-servers. Mid-servers are there to isolate your data center from their cloud. And these mid-servers can basically use Vault as a credential store. So you can keep your credentials uh, in your data center and under your control. Now, the mid-server does this using the Vault agent as a proxy. So this talk is going to focus a lot on that. The Vault agent itself has many use cases. In our case, it proxies Vault calls, uh, receiving them from the mid-server on a secured port and in sending them to the Vault server itself. By using auto-authentication, this simplifies the job of the mid-server. Uh, the Vault agent handles the authentication to Vault, um, and it'll also manage renewing the Vault tokens, authenticating again if required. The mid-server doesn't have to do any of that. When going through a lot of the tutorials, most of the example use uh, Vault's app role, where you get a role ID and a secret ID. And our team was no different. They went through the tutorials and the example started um, as a simple proof of concept. They asked for a single KV store, a single app role, a single policy set to read the secrets. So we created the storage backend. We created a new policy that allowed to read and list that storage backend. And we created the app role to associate to the policy. This app role would be used by um, the mid server. We generate a role ID, a secret ID, and push this to the mid server. On the mid server, we set the config for auto auth via the app role, just like in the tutorials. Everything great and everything worked great. But in the tutorial, there's a quick sentence the credentials will automatically rotate and, if required, re authenticate until max TTL is reached, and nothing more. Hmm. So there's a core challenge with most Vault solutions is, how do I rotate those secret IDs in a way that's secure? A lot of our solutions end up with that question. For now, we generated, we generated it and pushed the secret ID with a script. So we can keep doing this. If we're a development environment and we had pipelines uh, and continuous delivery, to help to help us out. In the cloud, 
machines could renew the secret ID by using its own identity and leveraging the cloud identity services. But this is an in-house, strictly operational uh, environment. For now, we'll stick to the script, running it once in a while. There's only one app role, right? As we ramp up the solution, because we isolate environments by networks, we find that there's more and more mid-servers, one per isolated network. Now the team continues to, to use the same approach, using the same app role. So the mid-servers all use the same role ID, um, but each machine has its own secret ID, which could be revoked. So as this started scaling up, our exposure risk increased. Also, it's a little harder to rotate all those secret IDs now. So we, we then created new app roles and assigned them each mid-servers. Now each mid-server has their own role ID and secret ID, but we still only have one policy and one secret store. So if any of the mid-servers are compromised, all the credential stores in the back end are vulnerable. And the secret ID also just got a little harder to change. Now, because the growth happened because of isolated networks, it, implied, it implies that not every mid-server has access <clears throat> to every endpoint. Therefore, it does not need access to those credentials. So by making a map of which mid-server requires which credentials, we can create an app role policy matrix. Also, we can group credentials into smaller subsets, placing them in their own secret store for easier management. <clears throat> so now we can create new KV stores to separate the credentials and new read policies for each KV store. Each mid server has an app role and each app role only has a subset of policies that it needs. This helps bring the risk back to a more acceptable level again, but we still haven't simplified that secret ID renewal. So we create new storage backends we create new policies for each of the secret stores. And the app roles already existed, so we just assign them the new policies. Um, and the app roles are given to the respective mid-servers. This corresponds to the matrix we saw earlier. But eventually, the secret IDs expire. We still haven't solved the secret ID rotation problem. Someone will suggest setting the TTL to zero. This even for a short time, making the secret ID last forever. But this is not a good idea and it's not really a solution. But with no cloud and no pipeline, it's not that easy. So let's find a solution. It was at HashiConf 2022, I saw a talk by Michael Aldridge. He was using certificate authentication um, to set the initial secret zero uh, for his servers. Uh, what was special about the solution was he was the use of a set of Acme servers paired with an internal DNS to issue certificates to his servers. All of this from first install. While not suitable for my solution, my situation, we were able to land on a similar solution around certificate authentication by using uh, Windows AD services. Now, all of our mid servers are already integrated into Active Directory and Active Directory Certificate Services, or ADSS, can be used to help manage a PKI chain. Through ADCS auto-enrollment, the mid-servers could get client certificates using certificate templates. As well, the systems are configured with group policy objects, or GPOs, to not only create those initial certificates, but also to rotate them on a regular basis. So let's do a quick dive on certificate authentication so we can see um, what are the parts that will interact. Certificate authentication relies on the properties of asymmetric encryption. In asymmetric encryption, you have two keys. You encrypt with one, decrypt with the other, and vice versa. So you keep one private and share the other, make it public. The first thing we can do with keys is signature and verification of data integrity. You do a hash to produce a fingerprint. You encrypt that fingerprint using your private key. This is now a verifiable signature. 
to verify, you perform the same hash operation on the data to produce the fingerprint. Then using the public key, you decrypt the pre-computed data, and then you compare the two fingerprints, the one you calculated with the one that was decrypted. If they match, we can say the data has not been altered since it was signed. So now that we have signature verification, we can move to something called proof of possession. This proves that you have the private key that matches the public key you sent to someone. This is the same as the last steps. Hash encrypt send, which is the signature. Receive hash decrypt verify, which is the verification step. The difference is the data. The data is the public key. There is no need to send the key because the key is the document itself. Um, so this is how CSRs are generated, um, but they also contain details about the certificates we want, the information we want in the certificates. Now, when creating certificates, the certificate authority uses proof of possession to verify the integrity of the public key you sent and that you are in possession of the private key that corresponds to the public key. While a traditional CA will do additional checks, such as ACME calling you up, doing emails. Um, this is where, and this is where those protocols come in, SCEP and ACME. They establish a trust identity beyond the data that was sent itself. In our case, we're going to be establishing that trust via Active Directory registration. The certificate will contain your public key, data, which is the SANS, the dates, the URL, uh, a common name, and a signature signed by the private key of the CA. For certificate authentication, the server will receive the client certificate. It will verify the integrity of the certificate, and then it will verify the signature of the certificate. It will use the public key contained in the CA's certificate. In our case, ADCSS will create and hold the issuing certificate, which is the keys, uh, the keys and the certificate itself. The mid server via auto registration will create client certificates using the ADCS templates. The common name would be used by vault for the machine identity. The client is on the ADCS server and is in inserted into every shirt auth role created. We're going to see that. Upon registration, the mid upon registration with AD Active Directory Certificate Services, the mid server will request a client certificate via SCEP, and the resultant certificate is stored in the server certificate store. When a client connects, so when it connects to Vault, the client sends a client certificate and it receives a, ser a server certificate. So if we take these two separately, the client will verify that the Vault server certificate is signed by a trusted CA. This is identical to what browsers do on websites. To simplify connectivity and increase the trust the client has that the server is authentic and who it says it is, it makes sense that the server CA is a well-known CA, either a public CA or a top-level enterprise CA. Now the server will verify the client certificate sent by the client using the CA certificate that was used to set up the, the auth role. This is the client CA that was created in by ADCS. Contrary to the client trust, to increase the trust the server has that the client certificate is authentic and um, valid, it makes sense that your issuing CA, you have an issuing CA expressly for that server, even a private root CA if your policies allow for it. The server should not trust all CAs, just local ones that are under the control um, or that are under its control. For the Vault server, 
Server TLS must be used for certificate authentication. This is part of the protocol. You can't do client TLS if you can't do server TLS. We enable cert auth and vault. We then create a named role. This, is, this was discussed earlier. In this case, we create the role mid1, link the role to the policy mid1 SID. We also tell the role which CA to use to verify. This is the client CA that was generated on Active Directory Certificate Services. And in our case, we also use the, common, uh, the certificate common name, and it must be mid1. The policy mid one sid allows uh, create an update on secret IDs for the April mid one. If we were using Vault Client, the login would look like this: the key item being the client certificate and the name mid one. The name mid one designates the role we are authenticating against. The client cert tells uh, tells Vault where to look for the certificate to send. The client certificate must be signed by the client CA that was configured when we created the client role uh, mid one. The client certificate being sent also must have a common name of mid one, but, or else it won't be able to authenticate. But this is if we were on a Unix system because our, our mid servers, well, they're Windows systems. So we need to use PowerShell for two specific reasons. One, the certificates created with ADCS are not stored as files on the file system, but are stored in the certificate store. Second, the Vault CLI does not support getting these directly. So we use PowerShell to get them and then use the invoke rest method to talk to Vault. We only need two transactions, login and get secret ID. So this is a fairly simple task. We find the certificate based on the common on the common name. We will need because we need the thumbprint for it. We set the URL to the cert API login for the role that we want. We create a JSON uh, body, we create a JSON file for the login, uh, specifying the role mid one. And then we invoke REST method to perform the login using the certificate thumbprint for the client certificate. And the return will contain the, the vault token. Now that we have a vault token in the return call, we need to build the HTTP headers expected, which will include the vault token. We then use invoke request to generate a new secret ID. Finally, we write the results to a file. Using the return value, we extract the secret ID and write it to the path expected by the Vault agent. So we've now rotated the secret ID for the Vault agent using the certificate. But I know what you're thinking, we're getting a certificate to get a token, to get a secret ID, to get another token, so we can read credentials. Well, that, that's a lot of tokens. Can't we just do cert auth in the vault agent? Well, yes, but for us, we already had the app role set up. So we're not changing the process very much, just the way in generating the secret ID from a script we run to a script the server runs. Um, this will make the change almost transparent and it also gives us a backup solution in case something does break. Additionally, if we did use the Vault agent, we would still need a script to export the certificates from the certificate store because the Vault agent can't read them natively. We can now look at the improvements that this has brought us. We have a way of rotating, renewing the secret ID using client certificates. And that client certificate rotates automatically using ADCS. So we now have full credential rotation for our app roles and vault agent from the registration of the mid server. With this, we can reduce the lifetime of the secret ID. Additionally, 
if we do a little bit extra work by coordinating the startup of the vault agent and the script to refresh the secret ID, we could change this to actually a one-time use. And if we get one-time use, well, we can delete it from disk after use. The vault agent will keep the vault token in memory until the max TTL is reached, and then it will try and renew again. But the coordination would make it so we would actually get a new secret ID. But if we take it off of disk, then that credential is no longer accessible to anybody. So it improves our security. So let's review. By using ServiceNow, we've eliminated direct handling of system credentials by individuals. Nobody needs to touch credentials anymore when we're talking about the, the ServiceNow installation. While the, uh, with the automation and the indirect referencing between the certificate, the app role, the secret ID, no one entity requires full access to perform their tasks. Basically, an external deployer that comes in and has to do an installation will never have in their possession everything required to access the credentials within Vault. The generation of the role ID is the only item not dealt with, and this is only once per server and is not considered a critical secret. We have an we, we've created an operational way of rotating credentials with certificates pushed automatically stored in the secret store, the secret ID being machine generated and short lived. We've reduced the chances of interception of any of these or opportunities for even careless operations like leaving a credential in a config file. These have all been eliminated. And if there was a leak, We've reduced the impact by limiting the pool of accessible, the pool of accessible credentials by separating the secret store per network. Now, if we look at how we can respond to this, if there ever was a breach or a leak, um, we can revoke the client certificates. This will stop the generation of new secret IDs. We can also remove the named certificates from the role effectively doing the same, but even if the certificate renews. We can also revoke the secret, any secret ID that have already been generated, so they may no longer grant tokens. And we can revoke all the leases, um, and this will delete any valid access tokens currently in use. And finally, with the audit log, uh, we can review what secrets the tokens have accessed, and apply remediation on those servers. And we can also go back in time and see how this whole thing, how this whole leak started. So as stated as from the start, this was a walkthrough and hopefully it can help someone. The goal was also to show you the progression of a solution beyond the simplified tutorials. We showed a solution where the cloud was not a factor. We used existing infrastructure services to help us perform secrets introduction and by constantly assessing the risk throughout the solution, we had the ability to reduce the risk through simple changes in our solution. So with that, I hope you got some insights from my talk. I know I did from others. I'm Anne Chiasson. If you want to reach out, you can use the email hashi2023 at servoevo.com for any questions or comments. You can also connect up uh, on LinkedIn and this slide deck will be made available. Thank you and enjoy the remaining talks.